Um, super, thank you very much. Um, I want to start by uh, uh, congratulating the organizers because this has been a really interesting workshop. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to speak here. So I'm Ignacio Reyes, I'm a postdoc at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, so here's a quick outline. I'm gonna start by reviewing some very well-known uh, aspects of uh, semi-classical gravity. Uh, then I'm going to move to the main topic, which is a story of dynamic, uh, dynamical moving mirrors and the relationship to black holes. I'm going to tell you how in this system you can actually solve, fully solve the exact back reaction problem of the quantum fields. Um, and finally, I'm going to make the connection to something that we heard earlier on uh, today, uh, which is uh, some experiments that, have, that, that are relevant for this field that have been conducted in the last decade. Okay, so semi-classical gravity uh, is a topic that we're all very familiar with. Um, it's the idea that uh, we have a geometric theory, it could be GR, we have uh, some other fields which could be classical or quantum, and we're trying to solve Einstein's equations uh, in this way. Now, of course, this is in general a very hard problem because it's highly coupled, right, in order to you know, if we want to compute a partition function or some correlation functions of the field, we need to have the metric, but in order uh, to have the metric, we need to solve this equation and so on. Um, so this is very hard in general to do. Uh, there are, of course, some uh, well-known exact solutions, but they are quite rare uh, and far apart. There are these classical uh, two-dimensional dilatonic solutions of Strominger, et cetera, um, collaborators. Uh, there are brain brain world uh, solutions in ADS-CFT, but 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 they're kind of uh, far apart. So, uh, what I want to tell you about today is about uh, another physical system that has uh, many similarities uh, with this problem that we can actually solve exactly. We have full control, um, uh, and maybe it gives us some hints about the physics here. So. Um, Although this problem is very hard, I think there's a, a logic or a procedure that I think of as a standard procedure in tackling this problem, which I can illustrate with the example of gravitational collapse. So the first step is to put h bar equal to zero. Everything is classical. Um, and we solve the equations of motion with a classical stress tensor. We can find some solutions. Uh, maybe they form trapped surfaces and therefore uh, lead to singularities. This would be, for example, the classic paper by Oppenheimer and Snyder. Uh, as a second step, uh, we can quantize the fields on top of that fixed background, but completely neglect their back reaction on the metric. And this is essentially what Hawking did. Um, we know that this, this, for example, leads to Hawking radiation and uh, to the information uh, paradox problem. Now, as a third step, one would like to solve the back reaction problem. So this equation over here, uh, non-perturbatively, but this is, of course, a, a very hard problem. Now, the last step, which is more conjectural, is we say maybe, OK, maybe we have to quantize everything, including the geometry. And although we have some examples of this, uh, it's not completely clear, uh, I think, what are we supposed to do? Um, oops. OK, so what I want to talk about today is the story of moving mirrors. So what does this mean? We have a, this is also very well known. We have a quantum field theory, which in here is going to be living to the right of the mirror, uh, which has, uh, and there's a surface where we impose reflecting boundary conditions. Now, it is very well known that moving mirrors uh, radiate, um, even uh, if we have the vacuum. Um, and this is uh, sometimes called the dynamical Casimir effect. Um, now, it is also very well known from the seminal uh, work by Fulling and Davis that if you consider uh, escaping mirrors, uh, mirrors that are receding away from the system, um, they are closely related to the problem of black holes. The easiest way, I think, to explain this is we just take a two-dimensional conformal field theory. Um, we have in this Penrose diagram, uh, the mirror is in blue and the CFT is to the right of this. Um, so we have some incoming uh, stress tensor that comes from past null infinity, that's T plus plus, and we have a reflected uh, stress tensor. And 
the point is that they are related by a spin two uh, contribution that's the classical piece but there's also an extra contribution which is the anomaly this comes with the Schwarzschild derivative so if we take as an incoming state the vacuum so where the uh, energy is zero if you take some particular uh, class of orbits that, asymp that asymptotically become null in a specific way uh, the reflective stress tensor uh, is simply uh, thermal and that's in a nutshell the Hawking effect um, now they further noticed that if you uh, do a conformal transformation to this Penrose diagram where you straighten out the uh, trajectory of the mirror the resulting thing uh, resembles very much the space-time diagram of a collapsing star into a black hole uh, you can actually check for example so in, in that case the what uh, what used to be part of future null infinity is what be, would become the horizon. And you can check that actually this point over here, um, it forms in proper time. Uh, sorry, it, it forms in a, in a finite proper time. Um, now, the point here is that the trajectory is being prescribed, is it's being given, it doesn't follow from some uh, dynamical principle. So what we want to do is to understand this problem, but we want to give dynamics to the mirror. Um, now, we'll also uh, hear more about uh, moving mirrors today uh, a bit later. Uh, so what's the simplest dynamics that we could uh, give? Uh, this was uh, worked out in a beautiful paper by Chung and Verlinde. The simplest answer is just to uh, give mass to this particle and assume that it satisfies the second law. Um, so it just follows F equals MA, where of course the derivatives are taking with respect to proper time. Now the force in this equation is the derivative of the momentum and the momentum is just given by the fields whether they are classical or quantum um, so here i want to highlight the similarity with uh, the problem of uh, fields in a curved space time uh, you have uh, on the one hand the energy the stress tensor of the fields and on the other hand you have a second order differential operator which in this case is related to the curvature in our problem it's related to the acceleration of the world line now, you can eliminate proper time from this equation to uh, make it a little bit simpler, and you get a simple, ordinary differential equation um, that relates the x plus and x minus coordinates of this word line, where you have the sort of kind of a source uh, that is given by the incoming energy. So now we can take the system and apply the, uh, the different steps in this standard procedure and see what we get. So the first step is to find the classical background. And here we're asking the question, what is the incoming energy such that the fulling Davis trajectory is the solution to that? Now, finding that is very easy. We have the equation of motion and we just do reverse engineer. We take the fulling Davis trajectory, we just replace it at the equation and that gives us the incoming uh, momentum. Uh, here's again, the Penrose diagram of this thing. So it's very easy to see that uh, this incoming momentum, the stress tensor is going to have a singularity around this uh, null asymptote. Uh, that's perfectly fine because, of course, you need an infinite amount of energy to accelerate a particle to the speed of light. Uh, so, so that makes sense. And this solution is what we could think of as the analogous of the background metric of the collapsing star, of the Oppenheimer-Snyder uh, solution. This is going to be our background uh, solution. The second step is we quantize the fields, but we forget about the back reaction. Uh, what do we get here? Again, uh, due to the conformal anomaly, the, the reflective stress sensor in the far future uh, looks thermal. Um, and again, here, if we now if we compute the reflected, uh, the integrated. Uh, reflected uh, energy, this diverges. But again, this is also fine because uh, if you want, the evaporation is just going on forever here, uh, so you get an infinite amount, amount of, of uh, energy uh, in the future, so that's also fine. Now notice that because the particle, which is following the equation of motion, uh, becomes null uh, along this line, we never needed to specify any information about the stress sensor to the future of this line, because the particle never reaches that, that region. Um, However, what happens now if we consider the back reaction? So we include now the anomalous term of the stress sensor into the force. That changes uh, uh, the equation of motion. We have this 
same differential equation as before, but with an extra term that has one higher derivative. There's a coefficient kappa here, which is a proportional to h bar, of course, and also to the central charge of the CFT. So now we can ask, well, there's an exact solution, but actually we're only interested in what the particle is going to do near the singular line. What do we do? We take our falling Davis uh, incoming stress tensor and we just solve uh, the equation. It's very easy to see that now there's a crucial difference because the, the slope of the curve at that, at that singular line is now finite. It doesn't go all the way to infinity. Um, therefore, uh, well, the acceleration does diverge at that point. Uh, but the conclusion is that the trajectory doesn't end there. It doesn't go all the way to the, to the boundary. It's just going to cross uh, that line. And therefore, uh, because it reaches that point, we need to, uh, we need to specify what happens after uh, this singular line. And that leads to some matching conditions, which in this case is the requirement that the slope has to be uh, continuous. So this is what the uh, solution looks like. Uh, it's, it's a solution that sort of smoothly departs from the uh, collapsing one. This is work we've done with uh, Piyush Kumar, who's an undergraduate from Mahali. So here we have the fulling Davis one in blue, and this is the exact back reacted solution, um, which departs at some time uh, from this other one. So what does an, an asymptotic observer see? Well, for a long time, they just see Hawking radiation. Then they see a short burst of negative energy, and then essentially they see the vacuum for uh, forever. So in GR terms, this would resemble, uh, just to do the analogy, a, a, a surface of the star which comes closer and closer to the Schwarzschild radius, but it never reaches it. Uh, we've also heard some ideas uh, about this uh, early on during this week. Um, another very interesting example you can work out is the case where you have two where you have two uh, mirrors. Then the dynamics becomes much more complex. And this is work we've done with Jakob Wintergast from Berlin. So basically it's answering the question, what happens if you take the Casimir problem where the two plates feel a force that are pulling them uh, together and then you let go. They're going to start accelerating towards each other, but due to the acceleration, they'll start radiating and that radiation in general pulls them apart. So there's some interesting dynamics uh, going on there, which is very non-trivial. Now, this is a very interesting arena to uh, test stuff like, for example, the quantum energy uh, inequalities. Uh, if you think of, for example, of the ANEC, uh, you would have a portion, a contribution that goes along the, the, this null geodesic, but then uh, you seem to, what seems to be happening is that you need to include the, the contribution of the boundary points, which are functions of the energy. And in this example, it's just, at least for me, it's completely not obvious that this thing is bounded from below uh, or is uh, non-negative. Uh, so I think it's a very interesting uh, test ground uh, to think about these ideas. Final comment here is that uh, if we specify now for a specific theory, namely for free fermions, you can go much further and compute really the full density matrix compute Rennie entropies, module Hamiltonian, et cetera. Um, now all those, this uh, theoretical, all this math is, is super fun and super nice, but uh, what can we actually measure uh, regarding this, these effects? So it's very well known if you take the Hawking temperature for a stellar black hole, the temperature is so low, it's way below the, the CMB temperature. So that sounds kind of hopeless. Uh, what happens now if you take an oscillating mirror? This is what Yvette was mentioning a while ago. The, you, can, you can calculate the, the number of photons per unit time. It depends on the frequency of oscillation, but it also depends on the maximum velocity of the mirrors. So if you just think about mechanical oscillation, you would get something like in the best case scenario, one photon every thousand years or so. So obviously uh, that doesn't work either. However, uh, Experimentalists have found a beautiful way out of this using optical methods. So the idea is to uh, simulate the oscillating mirror by changing the actively reflecting surface of a composite mirror. So in practice, I think the best example of this uh, was a paper around 10 years ago uh, where you have a transmission line, which that's going to act uh, as, as, as your space time. And at the end of that, um, 
you have one of these superconducting uh, interference devices, which is basically a device that is very sensitive to the magnetic flux that, that uh, is going through it. So what they did is to vary this magnetic flux very, very fast. And this is something you can do really fast. Um, and what, when you do that, what happens is that the effective length of the circuit is changing very fast. And that mimics this uh, moving mirror. And with that, you can get uh, many, you can produce many photons. And the, the really cool thing is that not only were they able to measure the photons, but they were able to check that the pairs of photons that came out were in a particular quantum state, uh, you know, two mode uh, squeeze state, which is amazing. This would be like the analog of, you know, being able to measure the two Hawking pairs and checking that they're actually in a Bell state, for example. Uh, so I think this is super interesting. Um, okay, so to wrap up, I told you about a solvable model where you can take a CFT and couple it to a dynamical mirror. Um, the back reaction, at least in some cases, seems to avoid what we could call the formation of a horizon. Um, and also that there are something like Hawking pairs uh, being produced actually uh, in the lab. So as an outlook, of course, we would like to uh, take our idea, some of these ideas from flat space time into a uh, curved space time. Um, another question is whether any of these effects uh, are, are measurable uh, in the astrophysics context. Of course, we've heard more about this uh, in this workshop. And I think more generally speaking, we need more interaction between the high energy theory people and experimentalists, for example, working on the Casimir effect. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ignacio, for, for the talk. Um, so let's go for the questions. We have a, a question of uh, Gerardo. So if you want to... Hi, Ignacio. Thanks for your great talk. Uh, could you comment a little bit on, on this last concrete setup that you showed us, this uh, setup with the script? Yes, uh, yeah. here you commented that it's possible to simulate Hawking radiation, right? By measuring the correlation of these uh, two pairs of photons. Okay, I, I wouldn't make such a strong statement uh, because this is, the physics of this is very similar to the, to the Hawking effect. The difference between these two or one difference between these two examples. So all of this is in flat space time. There's nothing curved in these experiments. Uh, this is, uh, like just a moving mirror in a two-dimensional uh, flat space time, if you want. What these people did is that by using uh, these devices, you can generate photons. Now, these photons come in, come in pairs, and you can check uh, what is the quantum state of those pairs of photons. And what they checked is that these pairs are entangled in a very specific way. Now, this is not exactly the Hawking effect for a number of reasons. First, because uh, Hawking effect is happening in curved space time. Second, because the Hawking radiation, uh, at least at late times, is something uh, that looks, that has a thermal spectrum, which is not the case here. Um, maybe there, I, I think there might be a modification to the setup that they had in order to produce uh, thermal radiation. Uh, but this, as far as I know, has not been done in, in the experiment. It has been proposed, but it, ha it has not been uh, actually done in an experiment. Um, so I think these two problems have a lot of similarities. There's a lot of connections, but it's not exactly the same problem. So you wouldn't put it on equal foot into, for instance, Steinhauer experiments, right? Regarding measurement of Hawking radiation in this kind of analog setups. I would put it, yeah, I would put it in a different footing. I. I I don't know if I would compare these two things because um, to me, from the more fundamental point of view, this looks more similar to the Hawking effect. Um, I think they're just two different, uh, they're using two different approaches. Maybe we can discuss this further on the Absolutely. Time. Yeah. Thank you very much for your talk. Thanks.